of the day for this, our main event of the evening. We introduce the champion, Chris, the West Side Strangler Brennan. Let's get it all! Hey guys, welcome to the podcast. I'm here with Russ Mira. Russ is one of my black belts. I've uh, been training with Russ for a really long time. He is he was 10 and 0 or 10 and 1, sorry, in MMA and he is an uh, ADCC competitor and also uh, was a EBI finalist, correct? Uh semifinalist. Semifinalist. Yeah, almost. And that was to who'd you run into there? Cummins? Uh, so the the second EBI I did, I did I in the second round I went against Cummings and then the EBI before that I went against uh, uh, Denny Pro, 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 oh, Prokopos yeah, or thank you, whatever thank you. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, that was in the semis okay. I lost uh, I lost in overtime but uh, it was still a great match you know I got to establish passing and uh, mount position Sweet. I didn't work one overtime at all for that tournament yeah I don't like the the overtime. <clears throat> rules per se just because the way they start um the position i like the rear the, the starting on the back is cool and the the position that's similar to my home base position yeah but not home base yeah if it could start in home base yeah it's, it's money that's what yeah. i pick but uh the the way that they start is is something that i've never played as well just because it's more of a gi thing usually because mm-hmm. you can hold the pants and whatnot but let's rewind okay and, and go back to <laughs> So pre jujitsu, how how long have you been wrestling? Uh, so I I, <clears throat> I wrestled from the time I was ten um, all through college, and I started training jujitsu when I was eighteen. So I'd already already had about eight years of wrestling okay. um, before I started jujitsu, <clears throat> and uh, um, however many uh, days I was practicing with my brother doing practicing the UFC techniques, like <laughs> Hoist Gracie triangle and that kind of stuff. Before wrestling or after you started wrestling? It, it was after I started wrestling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you wrestled through high school and then through college? Yeah. I was, I was, uh, when I was training with you, I remember I was training, uh, two wrestling practices a day and then still two jujitsu practices a day when I was living in the gym. It was, uh, so you weren't overtraining at all <laughs> back then <laughs> I could do it back then. I could do it now. Uh, not so much. Yeah. It's different. <laughs> um, so you've been wrestling, you started training jiu-jitsu, you're, you live in Fresno, mm-hmm. right? That's where you're from. So you started training jiu-jitsu and how long had you been training before you came down and, and we met? Um, I would say about uh, two and a half years I had been doing jiu-jitsu. I think I did, um, so the way that we met when we first met was, uh, you know, we heard about your tournaments online, you know, back when the forums weren't like super big, there were right. small forums. <laughs> And uh, I was, I brought it up to my teammates, like, hey, Chris Brennan is having a tournament. And it's like, you know, it's, you had the only Nogi tournament out there. And it was um, a round robin format, which is a format that I was familiar with, with wrestling. And also having coming from a wrestling background, I knew that the most important thing for my development in jujitsu was just to get that valuable mat time and experience. Right matches and uh also i remember you it was like 30 bucks or 35 <laughs> bucks and you gave us pizza yeah so that was free pizza yeah it, like sometimes if there was like eight guys you're getting seven matches you know in one bracket so it was i think it was my second or third tournament so we had there was eight there was me and eight other guys so okay. in one tournament i did eight matches yeah that's and so awesome. that the just the looking back on it that um <clears throat> That is actually the whole focal point of the reason why I throw tournaments now. And uh, I've never um, steered away from the original concept of it. You know, I've been right. approached by three different people to start like a pro thing and this and that. And I always wanted to stick to my grassroots and always stick to my concept of getting that valuable mat time and experience. Right. Um, I always guarantee any competitor two matches or more guaranteed. And even though sometimes like maybe a competitor gets one match and then their second match that person left or that person got hurt i'd still refund that those people the money because i want to stay true to sure what i you know what i um the reason why i created the tournament right so you you came down <laughs> did our tournament um you won and uh i don't know if it was that tournament that we started talking um a little bit because we we had, uh, what tournament did you go against? Um, the, the oh, uh, one, uh, Moses Delphin. Yeah. yeah. 
That was, I think that was the fourth tournament. Fourth? Yeah. Oh, so you'd, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was down the line a little bit already. Yeah. Um, you had, you had done, I guess, two or three before you, before you had come down and, and stayed down, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, I had, I think I did two tournaments when I was living in Fresno and then, um, after junior college, I decided to wrestle at Cal State Fullerton. And so that's what brought me down moving to Southern California. And, um, you know, it's like, I'm just kind of getting situated. I'm meeting the teammates, you know, I'm, 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 I want to train jujitsu, but I don't know kind of like where to go. And after practice, uh, Risto Mar Martin was like, Hey guys, Chris Brennan's looking for a wrestling instructor. Anybody want to do it? I'm like, <laughs> hell yeah. yeah I'm here. <laughs> and so, uh, that's how we, that was kind of like, in my opinion, the true beginning. Right. And at the very beginning, cause I was mid wrestling season, I was only really doing the wrestling classes and then I was I think I might have done a few classes but I wasn't like really in it but yeah I remember being so impressed with the level of guys that were there and of course like you're uh, you know this is back at a time where um, every instructor is a Brazilian you right. know and like you had ma made a huge name for yourself you're competing and you're running a gym you're training with your students every day and that was something that uh you know, really attracted me to next generation. Yeah, I was, I was definitely training with my students every day. It was yeah. like, a, that, th those were my training partners. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you had, you had come up really fast, you know, as you started training, competing in jujitsu and, and training jujitsu, your, your level went, you know, you grew really fast because of your wrestling background, mm -hmm. but also you were a good wrestler that you would you would play your guard as well oh, yeah. and you know and, and yeah. be really effective from your guard yeah. so you kind of developed a, a full game really quick and i kind of mentioned to you yesterday you and and like a javier vasquez were the only mm -hmm. two people that i knew that were like wrestle and then the second it hit the ground it was like mold right into jiu-jitsu you know mm -hmm. like you're right in all of a sudden yeah. into a scramble of i'm about to choke you or yeah or leg lock arm lock whatever but it was always super impressive your your speed you mm -hmm. know and and quick twitch muscles and whatnot um, and that's what, you know, led you to a, a, a really good, you know, jujitsu career, mm -hmm. you know, uh, coaching and, co and competitively. Um, so you started coaching for me. Um, do you remember when your first fight was? Uh, I think it was 2002. I think it was 2002. Um, and, uh, yeah, I was, you know, it was funny about MMA was, when I had first started jujitsu, it wasn't like I was like, oh, I want to like fight MMA or like when I, I didn't know that there was even like a sport of jujitsu or anything like that. I just really enjoyed like practicing it, drilling it, you know, like just, I think like when I was a kid, you know, like you're watching like Bruce Lee and do all this cool stuff. Right. And like, you, you want to do that, but like, you know, like, but for real right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and I think a lot of people know what I'm <clears throat> talking about and in the sense that it's very practical you're you would be able to do it in a fight and um yeah. but yeah my first fight was in beautiful uh Juarez Mexico Juarez Mexico, Juarez, Mexico 2002 and uh I think my opponent missed weight by like 27 pounds or something something close to that that was your first fight yeah uh, it, was, it, was a great ex it was still a great experience because, you know, it, you, you taught us to have that mindset that like we're going in here to finish whoever we're, is in there, whoever we're in there with. Right. And they could be our weight, they could be heavier, they could be lighter. And so, um, you know, I was fully prepared for that fight. Were you prepared though for that weekend? <laughs> um, so we talked about it a little bit yesterday. Give give the give the audience a quick little recap of fighting in what is Mexico. Okay, so so like I said, like you know, my guy was he was probably didn't miss weight. He was probably bigger. He was, I think he was one sixty five. I was less than one forty, and I cut weight for it. But you know, whatever. And I fought with uh, three of my other teammates on that card. And um, there was a lot of weird stuff that happened. For example, like right before the fight happens, the promoter comes in and he was like, hey, I'm pretty sure you guys are going to win, but can you guys like draw it out? And I'm like, what? <laughs> dude, we're, like, we're fighting another dude. Like, I'm not going to draw it out, you know? 
And uh, so, you know, I won, BJ won, Josh Smith won, and then uh, Alex Sergikov is the main event. And uh, so I, I remember I was keeping time, and there's supposed to be five-minute rounds, and Alex uh, <laughs> Alex takes the guy down, and he, he's basically in the process of TKOing the guy from Mount, and they call time for the round, and I looked at my clock, and I'm like, it's like two minutes and 20 seconds into the round, and they just stopped it, and they broke, and we went back to the corners. And these were fives, right? Like five-minute These rounds. were five-minute rounds, yeah. yeah. So, okay, so the second round, um, it's pretty much more of the same. Alex gets the takedown. He goes to the mount position, and he's established. He's basically in the process of TKOing him again, and instead of them uh, stopping it for the round, the referee, like, pulls him up. And then it separates them and starts them back on the feet. He like went arms yeah, yeah. under the armpits yeah. to stop him from swinging. Like double meat, yeah, double meat hook grip and yeah. lifts him up. <laughs> oh man! And then uh, so the worst part was, uh, you know, so we basically dominated for three rounds, and uh, Alex, uh, Alex lost somehow. You know, Alex won every minute of the round, and they, you know, they obviously screwed us over. And then aside from that, you know, we got like our. Uh, uh, our camera stole. We got yeah. a camera stolen, camera, a cell phone, clothes, clothing, stuff from our stolen backpack. from our uh, from our locker room, and you know to top it off, we also didn't get paid. Yeah, it, I think it was total. It was close four, to four thousand yeah, dollars. That's right. Yeah, yeah four thousand dollars. Between I'll never four, forget that. Bef- between four fighters. Yeah, and uh, I remember you were a little bit I, angry at the promoter. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my mind a little bit as the fight got stopped, or as they actually they raised the other guy's hand, um, and I kind of had a feeling like it was basically impossible that they would raise the other guy's hand. Yeah. But I, yeah. I had a feeling just yeah. as the rounds went, the way they were were doing it, and I kept telling the guy, yeah, you know, the 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 promoter was just next to us where we were in the corner. I said, man. You better not screw us. Yeah. You better not screw us. And then when the fight ended and they raised the other guy's hand, I I forget what I said, but I <laughs> I believe I threatened his family. I believe you did. And we were in Mexico, in a bad, bad part yeah. of Mexico. Yeah. And as I said it, right, we're in a we're in a nightclub and, yeah. and as I said it, it went from like being loud in the music playing just like in a music or in a movie you hear the record stop it was yeah. and it was dead silent as i said it and i was like so as he says it like he, like it was the weirdest thing like it's super loud and so when he yells it he threatens the promoter it's like dead silent so a lot of people hear it and uh you <laughs> you turn to me and you're like should i have said that <laughs> and i'm like yeah probably not so we rush back to our um, lock, you know, our locker room. We notice a lot of our stuff is gone. We just got what was left of our stuff, and uh, also my dad's, my dad's with us, and uh, you know he's like he's like tagging along in the back, and as we're leaving, there's there's a car, and th- this is like a, a road that has like five lanes, okay, and it's all the way on the side. So it's we're on the sidewalk, and the car is coming by, and it stops, and it starts backing up. And it's kind of like the moment, like when time freezes, and yeah. and like their lights Chris, were off, like yeah. they turned their lights yeah. off. And Chris goes, "Run!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And my dad's like, "We're in the back." I'm like, "Dad, let's fucking go right now! Let's go!" <laughs> my dad's like, "What?" Uh? I'm like, "So we sprinted all the way back to our hotel room." I remember we were like super hungry too. I was like, wanted like some street tacos or something. And uh, you were like, no, 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 we'll get food at the airport, but yeah. we got to make it to the airport. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was a, that was a good experience. experience. Yeah, it was, it was, it ma- that was makes your you debut. A man, makes you a man, dude. Like, makes you want to fight some <laughs> yeah. more, right? There was no amateur fighting back then, so yeah. like all four of them, it might have been the debut for everyone except for maybe Josh. Josh might have fought once already, or maybe not. Uh, I think it was Josh, me, Josh Smith, and BJ's debut, and then Russian had a few okay. fights. And and so, like those were their first fights, and and supposed to get paid. I, I'm not sure how the pay went between the four of you, but it was around four grand for four of you. So I yeah. don't know if it was a thousand bucks a piece, or yeah. if Alex was getting more. I or think something. Alex was supposed to get a little bit more, and like we might have got like eight hundred bucks or yeah. something like that. But and and nobody got paid. Um, I later ran into one of the guys in the bathroom at MGM Grand at the UFC wearing one of our shirts that our team had that night with one of my fighters names embroidered on his shirt 
and that didn't go over well. Um, that was a I, I so can't he basically he name. basically found he basically found the stolen shirt that was like from our locker room when we were out at the at cage side. Yeah. In Vegas. Yeah. God, that's so funny. I can't remember the guy's name. It was Eric something. He had been, I'd seen him on the Ultimate Fighter a couple times uh, coaching. Mm -hmm. So, I, but, but I don't know. I don't remember for who or what, but I, every time I'd seen him, I'm like, oh, that son of a bitch. Oh, that son of a bitch. Yeah. And then I walk in the bathroom and there he is. And yeah. I'm like, <laughs> so uh, I didn't get arrested. That's so good. That's cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So moving on from there, um, where did the majority of your fights, fights take place? Um, so we did like a uh, few Saboba, um, both, King both King of the Cage and Gladiator, Gladiator. um, Tachi, Tachi Palace. Uh, I fought once in Pancrase in Japan. Um, so those fights were after I, and then, I had uh, moved to Texas. Uh huh. Yeah. We did a respect in the cage, which is a show in, I think in Pomona. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sweet. So then, um, before I left mm -hmm. 2005, um, I get a, a pretty short notice invite to do ADCC, yeah. and um, I got to draw Marcelo, Marcelo Garcia, Garcia first round. Yeah. I had no clue who he was. Yeah. I knew he was good, but I had no clue who he was. You were actually kind of a fan. You you knew his game, and you're just like, don't let him get to your back. Whatever happens, don't let him yeah. get to your back. I'm like, yeah. okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you, uh, I got you, and you're an alternate, right? That's and right. got to yep. do a match with Jeff Glover. Jeff Glover, yeah. Do you remember what your record was going into that? I was, um, I'll answer for I probably you. It was forty, had, you know. Yeah, I think it was more. I think it was a little bit more than was that. It? Yeah, but um, yeah, it was a great. It was a great match, and it was a great experience because uh, I kind of got in because one of the guys missed weight, and they yeah. told me to be on deck, so I'm not going to miss that um, opportunity, opportunity and uh, you know have that to be under the like the big stage and what belt were you at the time? Purple. I was uh, I was brown. I had oh, just, you were brown I had just gotten my brown belt. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like probably, let's see. It was probably like in May. So I had been a brown belt for like five months or six months. Yeah. I remember there was a. I didn't argue a lot, but there was a debate when I said, "What's the game plan?" Yeah. <laughs> and you said, "I'm going to pull guard." And I said, "No, oh, yeah. you're not going to pull guard. Yeah. You're Russ Mira. You're yeah. you're a great wrestler." Yeah. And you go, "No, I'm going to pull guard." It's like, wait. And I was just, I was so confused. Um, by the fact that you wanted to pull guard, but yeah. you, you obviously, you know, you had mm -hmm. your reasons for it. And, and Jeff was obviously, you know, he was mm -hmm. a stud yeah. and, and real good. Uh, he had a great guard mm -hmm. and, and awkwardly flexible. Yeah. Um, how'd that go? It went good. Um, <clears throat> so he ended up, uh, we, we, we got into a scramble where from the top position, he kind of stood up and I shot a single leg. And on upon me shooting the single leg, he put me in an omoplata, and then from the omoplata, I'm basically the first thing is I'm defending like the submission, so there's not like a ton of tension, and he swept me so the the side that I was tensioning backwards, he went in that direction, and uh, wound up in guard, and then there's probably about only amount about a minute left, and uh, so he won. Two zero. Two, yeah, two zero. Yeah, mm -hmm. I knew it was a good match, and it was a good match. Yeah, I was like, you know, I had known that. You had already gone. You had already gone to Canada, right, and competed and beat the um, uh, someone at the trials. You did some trials. Was it before that? I, or after I didn't. That? I didn't get into the trials. That was back when. Uh, that was Rami. So Rami. Um, who, who did you compete against that was related or somehow to Alberto Crane? A competitor, uh, either one oh, of his oh, guys. No, 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 it was uh, uh, okay. So at Grappler's Quest, I went against um, one of his, like in their. Uh, you know how the Brazilians have the affiliation? Yeah, it's like their it was like their top guy in that oh, affiliation. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and I that was a that was a big match because that was like the first like world class black belt that I submitted. Yeah, and it's it was kind of like at a time where there wasn't like a lot of Americans that were submitting like Brazilians like like that. Right. You know. And what so belt that, were you when you did that? I was a purple belt. You were. Yeah, purple. yeah mm -hmm. that's what I thought. But leg locks. But leg locks. Yeah, leg locks. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while for. Uh, you know, people people talk about my passing and my staple, mm -hmm. you know, and I was like, you know, that's the that's the key if you're on top to stopping from getting leg locked, you yeah. know, and but now that leg locks are a, a huge thing, I didn't have to change my passing because we always pass. Yeah, like you that, already, do, yeah, you know, so yeah. it, it you know you kind of had that built in already, and now that leg locks is everything, um, it's 
it's important that you have that that you know in your back pocket that you always know to leave keep that leg stable don't leave it outside and, and whatnot to get set up but we had been doing them forever. I was like, well, we've been doing leg locks forever. Like yeah. I had Valig and Toff come show mm -hmm. us leg locks, you yeah. know, years and years ago um, in like 2000, 2001 yeah. or something. Um, but th there wasn't a lot of people doing them and there was definitely not a lot of Brazilians doing them. That's right. And, and so they were a little bit behind and mm -hmm. still might be a little bit. I think it was like such a, you know, like such a blessing in disguise and in, in training no gi all the way back then for so long you know because yeah. you know through the years you've really seen um i get I, I guess like jujitsu would be catching up you know i guess that would be the word i would be using and it's not like i'm like you know like um surprised right you know we're not really surprised at all that like oh yeah duh you can leg lock people right. you know like i remember I, w I always tell my students like there there was definitely a time where you would like have a conversation with a like a black belt and they didn't believe that they could be submitted with leg locks right okay and all of those people now they don't exist because they either got their knee ripped by some legit guy or they decided to tap and they have reconsidered their uh, <laughs> their theory they have re uh, evaluated their theory for sure it uh and it's what do you think how many years now since it's really blown up legs three four leg locks yeah like we're like not how long you've been doing them or how mm -hmm. long you know i've been doing but that, like where it's become the game mm -hmm. i would probably say it maybe a little bit longer than that like yeah. you know with uh i would probably say like gordon eddie cummings and um gary tonin uh, when you're watching these guys that are winning, you know, like for example, like when EBI's purse went from $2,000 to $20,000 and it's like, if you get four subs, you get $20,000. I think a lot of people, um, saw that. And there's a good majority of those submissions that are being done with leg locks because they're the, the competitors that they're going against That's where the, their deficiency is. Or right. it's how they play their guard, where they play their guard. And so, like, maybe say, like, a De La Hiba position, then the top guy can backstep and then go into, like, an inverted heel hook. And just, like, stuff like that, right? Um, they they have great attacks also off of the back and other attacks. But I think it really showed um, the world that that uh, you have to be versed in everything, and every, including positioning, you know? And um, I think that was kind of like, I think EBR was probably one of the main tournaments that was like televised where people can sit and watch and be like, oh yeah, you know, like right. you, in order to win that money, you know, cause there were some guys that won, but maybe they won like with one submission or two submissions. The ones that were winning the $20,000 were, there were some leg locks somewhere in there. Right, know? right. I would say in general, don't that's probably everyone's weakness right like not not everyone but like mm -hmm. in general mm -hmm. uh, on, a, on a grand scale the weakness of most people is the leg locks uh -huh. you know, the weakness of most black belts is leg locks so you have a good purple belt mm -hmm. and he's leg locking black belts mm -hmm. you know a good brown belt and and a lot of people have forgotten like john donner made the statement like i don't know why or something about people forgetting 50 percent of the body well, a lot of people went so hard on legs, they forgot the other 50% of the body. Yeah. You know, so it's like all legs and no upper body. But the guys with a real well-rounded well game and that understand legs very well, um, you know, they're they're the ones winning. Like Gordon, mm -hmm. you know, everyone thinks he's a leg guy, but he's got tons of rear naked chokes, you know, uh, um, and other, like, and I don't know why last year, I think it was last year, the year before, when he went against Bushesha, mm -hmm. um, nothing else happened after the point started but you know when he had him in his guard he locked up <laughs> swept right to mount yeah and i was like oh man this is gonna get ugly you know yeah. and then it all of a sudden it settled down and and not as much happened mm -hmm. after that but uh you know he he's obviously you know the the greatest for for a reason at the moment yeah and uh but his games you know it is well-rounded it's not just legs yeah. so yeah i think um <clears throat> so to your point you know, having coming from having came from like a wrestling background, you know, like um, when I was younger, we had a uh, Stephen Abbas. He was a uh, Olympic silver medalist. He was a world champion. 
and he's like our local hero you know what i'm saying like he's like what all the the young wrestlers are looking up to do you know where he went to college fresno state he went to fresno state do you know if is he related to Jaden abbas that wrestles so, at stanford so so, so Jaden so Jaden abbas is stephen abbas's nephew okay and okay. Uh, jerry abbas is uh um Jaden's dad okay okay cool cool and uh so basically what you're you're looking at is like you know when you watch some of the younger wrestlers they're trying to mimic their idol their idol has an insane low single we made the joke like it's not really a shot it's a teleportation <laughs> it's a teleportation to the single leg position and he, he was just beautiful to watch like in like he was a martial artist that was in the discipline of wrestling you know nice. it was incredible watching him but just like in jiu-jitsu you know people will follow trends so you have some of these younger kids that are coming up and they want to be like gordon or Gary, you know they want right. to be like what their idol is and they are only working leg locks right okay and then after you know <clears throat> and you'll see some like sometimes at the local level they'll do they'll have success with it and then when you have guys that have solid positioning they have solid uh, upper body and lower body attacks they know how to how to alternate between upper body and lower body attacks they know how to kind of like play games to kind of get you to defend in a certain way right. only to arm drag you and take your back um th that's when they're going to hit that like plateau and that that next level is yeah you got to train everything you got to learn um the positioning system you inside and out you got to learn like how uh like i said like arm arm control things lead to leg locks and f like when you have a guy fearful of leg locks it's a lot easier to pass guard oh yeah and so some of these guys that are coming up they're trying to skip you just got to learn leg lock I'm like no nope. yeah it exposed a lot of people mm -hmm. um first of all the leg lock exposed a lot of people that didn't know leg locks yeah and then the people who just did leg locks it, it exposed the rest of their game and to me not to bash rubber guard again but it's the same thing like once you pass the leg lock attack you know so many of them the rest of their game's not there, and then and then that's all that's all they had, yeah. you know, and they attack till it's gone. <clears throat> Same thing with a lot of I, I see, you know, with a lot of the guys with their play rubber guard. Once you get past that position, their guard just kind of goes to trash, and and that uh, that happened even with like Tony Ferguson. I just talked about this. Tony Ferguson when he fought Kevin Lee, uh, was it Kevin Lee? Yeah, and and Tony won, but he tried to rubber guard him, and he smashed, smashed, mm -hmm. passed, and mounted yeah. him, yeah. you know, and he mounted Tony, and I was like, you know, and then it just happened again this weekend with uh, Alima Lane McFarlane. She had Boogeyman in her corner. She wrestled. Mm -hmm. She fights for Bellator, mm -hmm. and she started setting up and just getting pounded on, mm -hmm. and then it just, you know, if they shimmy in and yeah. get in, it's just hard hard to yeah. use it. For MMA, it's, it's, I know they think it's a safe spot, but it, it really, it's not that effective with the sweat and that's why you mm -hmm. used to see guys like um i forget not soderopolis uh, uh, george soderopolis yeah, yeah, yeah he would fight uh -huh. with the legging like the yeah. sleeves on you know until they sort of outlaw on the sleeves but he would because he would need that friction the grip. Yep. To, to use it yeah. and that was always my thing like people mm -hmm. were like why didn't you even when you took your gi off why didn't you train in gi pants why didn't you train you know in whatever because I didn't want, like everyone says, oh, it's it's easy to, um, no gi makes your escapes easier, you know, so you need the friction in gi. It's like, no, I want to be the guy that can control that guy that's slippery. How do I control the guy that's yeah. slippery without having that friction, yeah. you know? So I don't want that. I want to know how to do it without it, you know? Yeah. And, and and so that's kind of a the difference. But going back to the, the well-rounded game, it's just like what, once your plan A goes, you've got to have B, C, D, Mm -hmm. all the way to z you know you've got to have that answer and and yeah. that's kind of where you've been your your whole career you've always had you know really good at leg locks mm -hmm. but had everything else you know mm -hmm. as yeah well. yeah i tried um you know like uh i guess like <clears throat> at the very beginning i didn't really know to you know like i guess like as a person like i didn't know really what attracted me to jujitsu at all and i think as i got older i started to really uh, respect when someone can look really good and then still lose, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, like if you didn't know anything, you'd be like, Oh, that guy won or how they carry themselves and that kind of stuff. And really what it was about was, um, not, not necessarily, <clears throat> not necessarily making like the perfect well-rounded game. So I don't lose. It's, it was more about just, uh, having that, that 
free expression to like express who I am. Like that's like, it's like a, I guess like a language or something, but um, it, it really, it, or like a artistic creation, artistic creation. Right. So, uh, you know, when I was working on things, like for example, like when I was working on Darces at the very beginning, um, I wasn't closing, I wasn't doing this good enough. So I, it works on guys my size, but bigger guys don't work. Yeah. That means, that means what? <laughs> doesn't work right doesn't work if it don't work on big guys and it doesn't work right so got to keep working it and i think that's something that um could be applied for any level of practitioner is you got to give yourself enough time to really get the concepts of whatever you're trying to work is you know like if you're working on triangles give yourself a few months give yourself a few months of where you're constantly firing triangles you're trying to figure out like all right like when they posture up, do I go to the arm? When I posture, how do, how are they posturing up? Right. You know, like what do I need to do to control the head? And um, I think just like having a background in wrestling ha- helped me understand that. You know, when we did front headlock position, like Clovis is known for a front headlock, and it's such a punishing position. Even if I don't score, it's like if I spend 15 or 20 seconds of the round and you down there, you're carrying my weight. Um, you, that means that's money in my bank, oh, right? Because yeah. you, you're carrying my weight yeah. so that when we maybe go out of bounds or we're back on the feet, you're way more tired than I am now. And uh, that re- that's something that really stuck with me. And I think like whether it's a, um, you know, a new practitioner, they're white or blue belts or whether they're like black belts, I think that's one of the main things that um, they, can, they can do better. You know, it's like you'll find an inspiration in something and then you got to give yourself enough time to do it. Like right. uh, recently, so I'll, probably about, I think six years ago, uh, you know that back crucifix that Bert Yoshida does? Yeah. Okay. So I was trying to do that for a long time. I couldn't get it to work. Okay. And, but I'm going off of watching him in matches, right? And then fast forward till about like, uh, you know, eight months ago, one of my students is like, hey, there's like a breakdown of it on YouTube. And the, f- the first one that I clicked on, in, in two minutes, I was like, got it. I know exactly what he's doing now. He's scissoring his legs. And I was trying to figure four, and that's why the arm's slipping out. And so we worked that for probably like seven weeks, six or seven weeks, and got it, yeah. you know? And so that's like a good example, you know? Like I have a lot of years of training, but for even as many years of training that I have, it, I wanted to work that for six weeks straight. Right. And it's like, all right, I got it now, you know? Yeah. Um, so going back to that, because I want to get, I want to I want to go back to you when you open your first gym, but I also want to then re-come back to the way you teach your principles and stuff like that. Um, what year did you end up opening your first gym, do you know? <clears throat> yeah, 2007. Seven. Um, you want the story? Yeah, go yeah. for it. <clears throat> so it was a very uh, unfortunate um, event. So... Oh, Chris is. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. OK, go ahead. I'm sorry. OK, so uh, Chris's uh, first black belt, Jeremy Williams, um, was uh, who I was training with at that time. Uh, you had already moved to uh, Texas and um, in an unfortunate circumstances, you know, he he took his life and it was a very all of the sudden it was a sh- it's still a shock still to this day. You know, we talked about it the other day. It is um, it's a cr- it's it's insane you know it's like there were so many emotions that you're going through there's a million questions and what's going to happen to the gym you know like and uh so uh me rick estrada um dino and adam lynn we decide that we're gonna carry on jeremy's legacy uh but we couldn't use the apex name um so we started subfighter and June 1st or June June 5th of 2007 so it was a, mo- a month after his passing so I felt like we did everything relatively quick we I think we did a really good job of keeping Jeremy's students together because yeah. I know in my heart he didn't want his students to you know wander you know like we wanted to keep the core group of guys together sure and you know um, for most of us uh, jiu-jitsu was our therapy you know it's like a lot of them just needed that 
Uh, I remember the first like month or two months, it was all like just like friendly roles. It wasn't like a heart, you know, it's not like I'm like, all right, I own a gym. I'm going to sh show everyone what I got. It wasn't even like that at all. Yeah. It was like, you know, very therapeutic, you know, some of the times after practice, we're literally sitting on the mat talking for hours and hours after practice, you know, and um, yeah, that was that was the first gym in 2007. And uh, I opened my own gym in 2016 without um, me on my own, you know, and able to run the gym how I had envisioned right. and how I, you know, um, wanted the students to learn and how I wanted uh, them to, you know, it's essentially what I'm teaching is a curriculum. And at some point I just realized that I can't teach things that other people have mastered, okay? But I can teach them things that I have mastered myself, right. you know, and that's what makes me different. And some of the things I've mastered myself don't necessarily include like things that are very, like for example, like I was very athletic, I was quick. A lot of the teaching principles and methods don't require that, right. okay? If you follow the <clears throat> principles, you yourself will develop your own game, how your, you know, how your mind, everybody's, everybody's different, right? Like I had one guy that was like very like non-aggressive in nature. And when I started teaching him wrestling, he was like, I don't think I could wrestle. I'm like, why? <laughs> he goes, well, I'm just like not aggressive. Like when I see you guys, you're like, bah, bah. you know, and I'm like, but that is who you are. Right. You don't change who you are for the martial art. Like the martial art will be an expression of who you are. So he got super good at just kind of like hanging back and he was like tall and skinny, just like these crazy foot sweeps. I'm like, bro. Flow it. Yeah, he's like <laughs> flowing. He's like, yeah, I, I get it now, coach. Like I don't always have to attack. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, because in your mind, when you picture wrestling, you're like Matt Hughes. Like, Grind. Yeah, like Grind. picking someone up and slam. You know, it's like, yeah. it doesn't, it, it can be like that. But that's not who you are. Yeah. That's not who you are in your mind and your emotional state. Like martial arts is an expression of who you are. So I'm not changing who you are. Yeah. You're, you, you are who you are and your game will um, become a reflection of that. Right. Yeah, so going back to how you, how you are teaching a curriculum is basically like Mike Kimura, for example, yeah. you know, I have videos from Pride Bushido One. It was like 2004, where I'm in my home base position. Yeah, you know, and I end up losing, not not finishing the position from there because I I wasn't wasn't mastered yet. But I all of my stuff was through trial and error of me yeah. trying to master it. You know, so I was there and I was trying, and then I switched to something else and still won with a Kimura, but just I I lost that position. I, I let go of it actually and moved on because I couldn't finish, and. So you're talking about you, you work things for seven weeks. You're working things with your students for that many weeks, but you work on it for years, right? Like I, I worked on my Kimura and, and developing the the details and the finishes mm -hmm. and the why does he do this? You know, the why is what everyone mm -hmm. forgets when they're teaching, you know? Yeah. If you tell someone to do something, they're like, yeah, okay, okay. You know, and they'll, they'll forget. But if you tell them why they, they're going to do it because the other guy's going to do this to you, you know, then they'll remember. And so it, it, I broke down my, my guard passing that way, my Kimura's that way, my guillotine's that way. And those are the three things that I'm best at. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, running into you when we uh, was at 2014, I think, uh, when I was getting ready for Worlds, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen you in, in a lot of years. Yeah. And uh, I, had, I had messaged Russ and said, hey, I'm coming out to do Worlds alone. And I was like, can I come by your gym and, and – uh, and hook up like you're just talking and, and we rolled and then uh you showed up the next day and and warmed me up and everything for it and and we just got to to talking and i got to then get a glimpse of your attention to detail like mm -hmm. mine like there's there's teachers and then yeah. there are guys that like really care about what they're teaching and then who, who they're teaching it to and how they're teaching it to yeah. them and and that's so that was really awesome for me to get to you know if you want to you can talk about since since you uh, said you basically teach a curriculum. What goes into like you said you can't master someone something else someone else has mastered. Right. What goes into you mastering something? 
oh, just <laughs> countless hours, countless hours, right? Um, so, you know, from the beginning of uh, me starting jujitsu, uh, having like watched wrestlers that were doing MMA, um, you know, like the big hole in their game was like the inability to pass. And I didn't want to be the guy that was like, you know, the lay and pray guy. But it's, that, that would be the worst thing that could ever happen. Like if I fought right. and that's what people are saying about me, then I have completely, <laughs> completely failed. Even if I'm winning, you know, I always wanted to get the guard pass and establish my positioning. You know, um, positioning is uh, really when you think of it, uh, positioning is everything in yeah. every martial art, you know, like in say for example like in boxing the striking art you know you have foot positioning you have hand positioning you have head positioning yep. right and it's like if you understand like what where what you need to do to get to a position to strike where the guy can't hit you that's like what the sweet signs of boxing is and that can also be applied easily into jujitsu you know like when i was fighting in mma the biggest gift i got from fighting was just the understanding you know like when you compete in a tournament you get you know, three points for a pass, four points for a mount, four points for the back. In a fight, you get to beat their ass. <laughs> and it's such a great feeling because, you know, it's like, I was like, there's like, um, like there, there's like feminine energy, there's masculine energy, okay? So the feminine energy of jujitsu is the submissions. The masculine energy of jujitsu is the dominant control. Right. And in the combat, it's basically elbowing and punching them to a pulp, okay? Yep. And so what I learned in, MMA was that um, at the beginning of me fighting, it's essentially uh, double leg, firing sub attempt, sub attempt, sub attempt, sub attempt, sub attempt until I get him. And then I think it was after my third fight, I went home. You know, like when you're, you know, when you're, when you're trying to go to sleep but you can't because your mind's just keep keep going. And I'm realizing that what I'm actually doing is not jujitsu. And it's not jujitsu in the sense that, um, the, yes, the techniques are jujitsu, but the mindset and the understanding of what I'm doing, that's not jujitsu. It's not an educated way of finishing someone. I'm not, I'm not getting to the weakest part and then damaging that and then finishing them. I'm literally more off of talent right. and physical ability than relying on a method, okay? And then halfway through my career, you know, it's like, like I was telling you the other day, like the first elbow that I landed in an MMA fight, it was like the light bulb goes off like ding. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, duh. I don't even have to pass a guy's half guard. This guy's like passing it for me. This guy like wants out a half guard. to like pass the side control. Cause I'm like doing so much damage so quickly with elbows. And I'm like, I could do this all day. Right. I could do this for like half an hour straight. This guy can't take this for more than maybe 30 minutes. more yeah 30 more seconds maybe yeah. he's got and so that was that was a lot like a big thing for me um and and for myself the whole reason why i fought was i really wanted to test jujitsu against you know a striker a, another grappler a wrestler kickboxer boxer you know like every type of yeah. thing and, and, and allow it to to adapt on its own i was very um like in all of my fights i didn't um watch any of the guys that i fought i didn't i i i felt more comfortable just going in there and like literally fighting the guy than going on his facebook and i'm like oh he does this he does this i'm like you know the only thing i really wanted to know is if he was south or orthodox yeah you know that's that's pretty that's pretty much it but it's almost like how you would like encounter someone like in an alley or something it's right. like how it's going to unfold that's what's going to happen right now right you know yeah so I don't even know if there was ways to watch guys when I was fighting at the beginning. You know, I, I, I yeah. would uh, basically just want to implement what I was going to do, you know, and if you try to do something else, I was going to steer you back into what I was trying to do. And, and so that's how I, I, I didn't watch a lot of footage either. Lucas will watch his guy one time mm -hmm. and then the and rest he, is yeah. on me. Yeah. You know, we want to know if he's a Southpaw Orthodox and the rest is on me and, and uh, Rafael's boxing coach to then coach the camp do this do this do this you know the guy might do this or whatever but he doesn't like to get in his head about watching it either and and you know yeah. otherwise you'll just do that over and over again they, they did it a little bit in high school when they would have a guy coming up who was 
a two-time state champ, yeah. you know, and he beat this guy who beat him, yeah. you know, and then it just it starts to get in your head. Yeah. But if you go in there with the with the plan of doing what you want to do and implementing your your game plan and yeah. whatnot and working on the things that you're working on, you know, I, again, my whole game came from what worked and what didn't work while fighting. Yeah. You know, I didn't compete a lot in jujitsu before I fought. I did a lot, you know, a good amount afterwards, but it all, I, I, I want to know how this is going to work in an MMA fight, yeah. you know, and, and I've got wins and losses because of it, but I've got a great friggin' system now because yeah. of it, yep. you know? Yeah, you know, basically, you know the truth. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, and to me, that's really important, especially when you're teaching something that, for example, say like a, someone comes into your gym and they're like 44 50 years old how is that person gonna finish someone that's attacking them right right and when you break down what your what your game is it's you know it's it's very much about understanding the control to get to the attack positions where the kimura oh yeah it's easy to finish now even for a regular guy you know and that was another thing that um on my first day of jujitsu I was blown away by like uh, coming, like I was saying, like I had eight years of wrestling when I started my first day. And when you see someone control someone and mount, you're like, F that, like that you ain't controlling me like that. Right. And then you get controlled like that. And you're like, damn, <laughs> dude, side control. You, I'm trying to bridge and I'm like, can't get these guys off. And I'm like, dang, okay, so there's a lot of control. But the main thing was just the practicality of it. You know, it's like makes so much sense. Like these right. things are like on certain sweeps. These are like basic mechanics. You know, you take away a base and you elevate them to the side of the base that was taken away and right. they roll over, you know, like a forward roll. Yep. And uh, that was something that really, you know, like as I'm as I have students now, you know, it really has paid off that. Yes, it's it's you try to simplify what they're learning, you know, like you don't want to overcomplicate things like same thing like when I first started fighting I'm trying to do too many things and then when you really condense down what you're doing it's actually easier to train for fights the more fights I have under my belt because it's like you're you're you really understand like okay I got these sharp weapons just gotta sharpen them okay when it's time when I don't have a fight booked then I'm trying to expand some of the stuff that I'm doing you know going out when you're rolling like you're okay, I'm okay to make mistakes now, you know, like right. get caught more and that kind of stuff. But like when you're closer to a competition, you just want to sharpen, just want to sharpen what those tools that you have. I think people get caught up in the not wanting to make, make mistakes in the roles in yeah. their own gym. And that's where the mistakes need to happen, right? If you're going to yeah. make them, you don't want them. Yeah. You want them to be there, yeah. not, you know, in the competition where it matters or in the fight where it matters. Um, and, and people get into that so competitive in the gym that they don't expand a whole lot because they don't try you know and open up uh unless they're going with somebody that they're positive they can beat you know what i mean and it doesn't matter if it works on them it needs yeah. to work on the guys who who's gonna you know who's gonna be tough in, in a difficult role yeah that's a that's a great point you know um the most ideal situation would be like you know you can have two guys that are that are both equal skill and on almost like a daily basis they're like catching each other versus like i you know i know your game you know my game and i'm gonna clam up so that you don't i don't really expose too much but then it's like but then what are you doing we don't tap each other for two years yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. you know right. what i'm saying right yeah. but it's like are you are you doing that to like keep score in your head you right. know and so that was that was um i would say that was something that probably around purple belt you know brown belt for sure where i think like prior to that i was going like hard every role hard every role even with like the new guys and and it's like that's probably not the best way of handling it you know put yourself in bad situations where you have to force yourself to get out right. stuff like that where you get some work they get some work and just understanding that like you know you have to make the mistakes in practice yeah. it's okay you know like um getting getting tapped as part of uh, getting better, um, you know, some, and then sometimes like you do something that you previously thought was like really dumb and you're like, oh, actually this works. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like a, 
it's like a surprise like yeah. no this is actually good for your game we're gonna we're gonna use this but i would have never done that if i didn't care right. you know like you got to kind of have a uh and of course there's times where you're gonna go hard you know sure. like like roll time where it's like all right dude it's go time and then um but yeah like what you were saying um you you can get too caught up in a mode sometimes especially if you have the same training partner every day and where you're like oh i don't want to get tapped i don't want to you know what i'm saying and it's it's just uh you don't really get the full benefit of the role right you yeah know? for sure you don't it's like it's like sometimes when you see beginners like when they're like they don't want to get tapped but there's zero engagement in like a five minute round yeah you're like hey hey bro you know, you don't have to be in jiu-jitsu to do that. Like, you can just go to the running store and get some running shoes. You could just take off running I watch guys shake hands, yeah. stand up, and back up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, your martial, you, your martial art could be running, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Like, like, I'll literally watch people shake hands if they're on the ground and yeah. stand up and yeah. then back up. Yeah. I was like, where are you going? Yeah. Like, we have, this is, we have to be yeah. in, connected in jiu-jitsu. Yeah. You know, there's got to be contact. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's a bummer that people ego gets caught up so much in it that, mm -hmm. that they you know they roll like that so i i mentioned a second ago or a little bit ago i feel like my game got to be i didn't have a coach right mm -hmm. like from yeah. blue belt on i didn't yeah. have a coach and so everything i did was was developed you know through my training with with you with like i didn't wrestle either didn't mm -hmm. have a wrestling coach yeah. you were my first first person to teach me wrestling you know, and, and then I was fortunate enough when I came here that Kendall Cross was here. Speaking of good low singles, <laughs> yeah. uh, Kendall Cross was here and I, I got to do, you know, uh, uh, training with him all the time. And, and when I got to, with him, I had been doing my double, you know, effectively for years. Yeah. And he made one tweak. And at this point, I'm third degree black belt. And I, I got in my car and I drove home like, oh, my God. Yeah. You know, I learned something amazing it was like little little thing but it's at that level it's so nice to learn you know to continue to learn so but i feel like my game got to be so fine-tuned because i didn't have someone say no don't do that you can't do that you have to do this do this you know yeah. and so i found out you know through trial and error like i said and and I, I had some basics and then I did all of that based off of trial and error. You, I feel is kind of the same way. You had me early, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and, and well, I guess for a while till, till what Brown Brown, Bell. till Brown. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then, uh, I, I came here, you had Jeremy, mm -hmm. you know, but that time you guys were the, the most, the majority of you were doing my basics sprung off into everyone. You had your own game. Jeremy yeah. had his own game. Yeah. And then you were on your own. Mm -hmm. and, and then you got to continue to do what I'm talking about. Yeah. And I think that makes such a, and now you're able to teach that yeah. at such a refined level yeah. to your guys. And it's the same thing when I teach my guys, you know, if I have people that aren't paying attention, I'm like, bro, like, you don't understand what you're learning right now or how lucky you are to learn it. I'll go teach a seminar somewhere and there'll be black belts as I'm teaching my basic Kimura. Mm -hmm. And they're just like, whoa. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I got white belts doing this shit when I'm teaching that, you know? Yeah. And, and it's just, uh, it's, it's different. And, and I think that's the same thing goes for you is why your system is so refined and effective, why you have purple belts that tap black belts. Yeah why you have you know and we've always had that then like mm -hmm. i had you tapping black belts yeah you know and and it's why you typically if you go back to the beginning lower belt guys didn't tap higher belt guys absolutely not it wasn't a thing no. like you knew if that guy was a blue he wasn't tapping the purple and if it was he was getting his purple that day you yeah. know he was that yeah, close he right. was that close and and, and it, it went like that all the way up yeah but then as as we were always nogi you know once we got a hold of these guys in in uh on the mat in a competition in the room wherever the lower belt guys were beating them mm -hmm. you know and it was it was happening regularly yeah and uh now it's awesome to see like i've got guys that do that and and i've, I've had a blue belt colton that that broke three black belt arms <laughs> as a blue belt you know Dang, before he got yeah. his purple belt with kimuras and and one of them uh wouldn't engage uh -huh. for three minutes and Dang. I was like, Colton, 
uh, it's jujitsu. He's got to engage at some point. And the guy hopped down, rah, got a Kimura ripped on him. And he goes, man, I knew that was going to happen. I was like, can you imagine being a black belt saying, yeah. I knew that was going to happen from that blue belt, you yeah. know? And that just goes to show the, the weaknesses everywhere else, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and that's why you now have, you know, multiple guys when you, yeah. when you, and you've always been able to do it, but you have your mm -hmm. own students doing mm -hmm. it. Yeah. You have a, um, basically you've like sped up you know, so you have like, you know, close to 30 years of training, right? And you have sped up through trial and error, 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 how fast you can get a student's understanding up to cl not quite there, but close to that understanding. Yeah. So you'd be like, hey, this is where I messed up. Okay, this is what I was doing, you know, like, and you can kind of like, um, I felt like uh, when I first started uh, Subfighter, I took that responsibility very serious and i think at the beginning i made a lot of mistakes that at that time i didn't know i was making so the mistake i was making was i think i was teaching too many techniques okay it was just too much and then after you know maybe a year and a half start to realize that the that there's not a lot of things that the students are doing collectively right. whereas like they, they're passing different they're you know and then so i started to realize like i'm because i'm teaching so much there there's not enough time for them to spend mastering the stuff where whereas me um when i was at their stage i'm practicing like three practices a day right right so of course i'm gonna get it but they're they're doing one third of the practice time and so it's it's different right so i think uh as a teacher i made the corrections you know, you got to be honest with yourself. Like, sure. hey, is this working? Not, is this working for like a high level athlete? It's probably working for a high, high level athlete. Is this working for like a regular dude? Right. Like a regular dude with like kids and stuff like that. Right. And so that's when I started to kind of like craft my, um, you know, just, just come to understanding like, hey, what is it exactly do I want them to know? What do I want them to be good at? And I, you know, I'd go home and I'd just like write, stuff down and then like a week later it'd be crossed off <laughs> and then like write some things down and then cross it off and then like the stuff that i still had that was written down i'm like oh yeah this yeah. is what they need to know you know like on the feet like how do you teach a regular dude to take down like a dude like 200 pounds all right this is how you do it you know we're gonna get to our over under we're gonna get to our inside trip we're gonna get to like things that like a regular person can do yeah. you don't need to be fast explosive or anything like that right and uh, it, 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 I, would, I would honestly say it took as many hours of thinking than it did of hours on the mat, you know? And yeah. that really, <laughs> wow. and, and remember, while I'm doing this, this is making my game better. Like, oh, yeah. I'm like, dude, like, like, like this is crazy, you know? Yeah. Like, when, from the first EBI that I did to the second EBI, even though I was eliminated in the second round, dude, my passing got, like ridiculous yeah. you know like i felt so comfortable in any type of guard like any type of like weird co leg configuration any of that stuff i felt so comfortable i knew exactly how to get out and establish the passing position um i felt like uh my a lot of my attacks that would go from like a like a pass into like a scramble or like a, a pass into like a back take got super sharp right and so what was I doing? I was doing more reps of less, or yeah, more reps of less stuff yep. instead of, you know, less reps of more stuff. Everything. And realistically about th probably three weeks out from the tournament, I was only practicing about an hour a day, but it was like super, super concentrated hard drilling. And that was the only tournament that I've ever done where I filmed myself um, 12 weeks out, 10 weeks out, eight, six, four, two. Um, I think the last one was five days out. And you can see the difference. Yeah. Like it's like sharper, 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 like razor sharp. And it's like um, every competitor needs something that they have confidence in. For me, it was like speed. So it's like speed and timing. Like when I feel like my, my attack sequences are good, yeah. I'm, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? 
And so for me as a competitor, it's almost like I'm realizing that like I'm basically I'm coaching myself. I'm using my own coaching method. Yep. But that was like going back to what you were saying is like you have you have grown so much from you understanding what your teaching method is and exactly your understanding what exactly it is that you do. And, you know, it's like the, the, the time that we rolled um, when you came to train for the world, it was cool because it was it was like 50% it was so familiar. Yeah. And then the other yeah. 50% I was like, whoa, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, damn, you know, like, and I feel like also I had a little bit of that as well. You know, like I yeah. had back in the day, like it was like our old school role. And then there's a different like yeah. type of passing, different way I like go left and right. And that kind oh, of stuff. Oh, it was so fun. We, yeah. how, we rolled like 20 minutes yeah, probably. It Maybe was good. a little more, I don't know. But it was so cool. And I left there and I was like, man, that was so cool because I'm doing this, he's doing uh -huh. this, you know, and and I had, uh, like I said, I had I had been working passing. Like passing is my favorite thing. Like mm -hmm. more than Camaras, more than guillotines, passing is my thing. I could yeah. teach passing for two months straight, yeah. and and uh, when we started talking. I then had your sequence one, two, and three uh -huh. entrances yeah. that basically led right into my passes. Yeah. And I was yeah. like, dude, this is so, I came yeah. straight back and I was like, hey, can you send me a video, yeah. you know, of what you, of what you were doing with that, your, your sequences to your entries. And then I showed all the entries, yeah. you know, for about a week, week mm -hmm. and a half, and then rolled right into my passing mm -hmm. off of those entries. And now, you know, they're part of our drills. You know, the entries are part of our yeah, drills because yeah. you were doing it. And then I took the leg drag one and turned that into another drill that we do from side control uh, to knee in the hole. Mm -hmm. And there's inside heel hook yep. there. Like there's a bunch of things that I play with off of that. And it was like my game that turned into your game that branched off of my game. Yeah. And it was just like, dude, we like everything flowed so well together. Yeah. Um, it was, yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. Super, super it was, cool. I think it was the, the last role that we did at the, the last one. And it was so cool. 21? Yeah, 21, 21 when my knee was uh, yeah. better. And it was so funny because you, I, I'm almost positive. Did you I use your stuff on you? <laughs> well, you used your stuff on me to set up that flying Khmer. And I remember like, as I reached and you went, and I was like, oh shit, dude. Like <laughs> he's, he's got it for sure. But it was so clean because it's like, it's not really like I changed your game. It, it it's like it's kind of like a filing system right. on how to get to your game just a little bit more oh, efficiently. No. It, you it, know, it and definitely and, like take credit. It yeah. changed the. It, I mean, it changed the, the part the, of my game yeah, for sure. The way you, you would know? enter yeah, the situation. For sure. Yeah, for sure. And now, like, I don't care whose guard it is. I don't. I just. Yeah. I'm coming in. Yeah. Here, here I come. Yeah. Better yeah. figure out a way to stop me. Yeah. You know, and I'm here, 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 and I'm just going. And it, and it just, uh, it definitely made my entries, you know, it wasn't something I had worked on. Um, I had been working on my passing, mm -hmm. you know, but you take two steps back and now you got to enter, you yeah. know, and a lot of people try to keep you out at that point, you know, and, and uh, once, like for me, once I'm in, I feel like I'm passing. Once I'm chest to chest, I'm passing, mm -hmm. you know, but getting there on a lot of people is difficult. You know, they play a, a longer outside push away game, yeah. stiff arm game. And, and so that the direction changing, like what really made a huge difference in my in my uh, passing. And now I will I will change directions three, four times to pass. Yeah. But each time I change, I'm moving forward a like little a bit, step ahead. Yeah. a little bit, yeah. a little bit. And mm -hmm. next thing you know, I'm either in psych control or mounted on you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, that was, that was super cool. And I, yeah, I definitely took, you know, what you, Heck what you yeah. showed me and, uh, you showed it to me actually in, when I was in California. Right. Mm -hmm. And then continued to work it off your, off the video you sent me and then added it with the boys and then, uh, started teaching it to the, to the, the rest of the class. And then, but at that time I was just doing it on everyone, you know, and I've got a guy, Robert Shelton, who's about 240 black belt, who's got a pretty good guard. He's a, he's a big guy, but he's, his guards good enough and he's strong enough to give me a little bit of problem. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was trying it all on him every night. You know, I would pass, hop back in and do it mm -hmm. again. I wouldn't pass and like try to finish. I'd hop, I'd rip right back yeah. to guard and do it again, right back to guard and do it again until I really started getting all of it and I was like, yeah, this is money. 
yeah heck yeah money. yeah and that's another thing about just like um training for so long is like what keeps you motivated it's like stuff like that yeah. it's like that that new that next like discovery and it's yeah. like it's is just like such a rewarding like when you're telling me this dude it makes me feel uh so good yeah. you know what I'm saying? it's like such an amazing feeling but yeah i mean it's like um it never ends yeah it, it never ends you've got to be open to learning right still you know i i tell that to my kids all the time you got to be coachable mm -hmm. and open to when someone teaches you something it doesn't matter if it's you pj you know, I'm going to try it. And if it works, awesome. I'm going to, you know, sweet. Yeah. I'm going to add it. But you just have to be, you know, able to learn and, and uh, be open to someone showing you something, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, figuring it out. But, yeah, it's, it's – uh, that's the best part about it is your constant. Like, I can sit back and watch Luke and Ty roll with each other. Mm -hmm. And this has been, like, for the last five years. And we'll learn something every time they roll because I'm just like – you could you can do that yeah. you know and they're both flexible and they're both um real agile and and uh awk, like uh uh scrambly you know and and so not everyone you know i might not i maybe i can't even but i'm gonna i'm gonna take something from it that i can use and and apply it and so it's yeah just it's cool but yeah thanks yeah oh yeah no thank you <laughs> it was awesome thank you uh, I remember when uh, I first started training with you. Um, so my first instructor, he was a he was a good instructor, you know, uh, and he taught me a lot about what uh, jujitsu is about. But when I started training with you, I didn't know that like a Kamura was like an entire like attack system. Yeah. Right. And you know, like I I got a few, you know, I was comfortable with doing Kamuras, obviously not on the same level, but like I love arm bars. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you're like. Dude, you could do the arm bar. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I could use the Kimura to get to my arm bar. The, the majority you know? of my, my finishes actually end up end arm up bars, arm not yeah. Kimuras, but it yeah. all comes from yeah. once that grip's locked up. Yeah, and that was such a that was such like an eye-opening um, moment. I have like a funny story I always tell like my students. And uh, we, were at, um, we were at a tournament where the – the mats were like um it might have been like a best of the west tournament where the mats were like that and i was going against a 10th planet guy and it was right when eddie had his first uh gym so he had that little group i was going against um one of their guys that did like rubber guard and that kind of stuff and so i so i so i passed guard and he With did me? that yeah and in so vegas i don't know if it was in vegas it, i want to say it might have been in socal okay somewhere but um we were on the far side so it's like you know i can hear your voice in a million people right? right and so when i passed he did that jailbreak thing and i you know so he puts me back to guard okay and then he i do the pass again he puts me back to guard again okay so in the third pass uh tracy was walking by and he goes just go north south and i go north south and it's like the easiest camera <laughs> like i've ever done in my life and like so going back to what you're saying is like you know some people can be really good like for example like he was really good from side control right so it's like side control like you know b plus a minus north south like c d right. you know what i'm saying like very easy right like finish but it was like a it was kind of like uh like such a important match for me because it's like you know every j just like how people are susceptible to certain submissions that you got also got to look at it as the dominant position as well you know for for when i had first started like mostly white blue purple because i'm a wrestler i was so comfortable at just sitting in side control but there's not a lot of high percentage submissions in side control especially given the fact that when they know how to frame properly right. it can be pretty difficult yeah. you know but going to north south going to the mount position and going to the back are like higher finished positions and you be I needed to force myself into those positions and yeah sure enough like you know north south is one of our main dominant attack positions even for the kids yeah like I have one kid he he literally knee slices to pass guard every time it's only a knee slice right he'll get through he'll try it 50 times he'll get through knee slice works <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> the basics work yeah wow 
<laughs> what, what a concept, right? <laughs> and he'll settle into he'll settle into north south. He'll get the Kimura and step over armbar, and he'll do it like every single match, right? And I love seeing that. Yeah, I love seeing that. You know, because he's like he's really like his favorite position. You know, you you got to have a favorite submission. Sure. But also, like, you got to have a favorite position, and you got to know how to you got to know how to get to. <clears throat> You know north south from side control you got to go north south from mount north south from the back position and make all those little chains right. that go to your favorite thing you know yeah oh yeah and uh that was uh anyway that match was like very uh you know i we we could have probably been doing the same thing like i pass he puts me jail breaks me puts me back guard right. through the and, whole match yeah yeah through the whole <laughs> match and it's like yeah yeah it's um i i, I I used to have people like I was talking about the Colton guy, Camaro's everybody, and people that he was Camaro's like, do you need to do something else? You need to do other stuff. I was like, well, you why? Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't stop no, yeah, stop no, me from you, doing this, you and need I'll to defend. Yeah, stop me from doing this, and I'll do something else, yeah. right? But if you can't stop my my A, why do I have to go to B, C, and D? You know, mm-hmm. and that's the, that's the same. I, I always thought the same thing, and I have my passing system that leads right to my Kimura or my guillotine and I, I from top or bottom the Kimura and the guillotine are very close to each other the counter to one gives me the other and, and I, I'm able to play off of those things and it's it's just always funny like is that all you do I was like no it's what you always give me yeah, you know yeah. I'm not forcing you <laughs> to give that to me I'm not like muscling that from yeah. you you're you know 240 pounds and I'm still hitting it right so mm-hmm. it's clearly it's effective the way to do it so it it I teach, um, I try to, sometimes people ask me like, what, what can I do, you know, to, to get better? And, and something that I started doing a while back would be like, pick a sub, you know, and just do that for, mm-hmm. for two weeks, you yeah. know, just attack left <coughs> arm only. And it's a great, it's a great uh, drill, I guess, or, or, or whatever thing to work on because number one, you're not always gonna get it so your ego is going to get checked because you're not winning or tapping someone every round, mm-hmm. you know. But also, like, I like to pick the, the back, p- pick the rear choke. Why? Because you have to pass the guard. You have to get side control or mount to get the back. Yeah. And there's got to be a way, a, a path to get to the back. So in that time, say they pick two weeks of, of getting the back and, and rear choke. In that time, they're going to start to develop different paths to the back. You know, they'll, they'll find different ways to the back. And they've got to pass on arm bars, pass on legs, pass on all these things to get to that position to work their rear naked chokes. You know, for the longest time, rear naked, choke, rear naked choke was probably my weakest. I could get the back really well, but I could take the arm bar off the back so easy that I, I'd fight for the neck for a second and then go right to the arm. Yeah. And, and so I made that weak. So I started doing this where I'm just going to get rear naked chokes. And so once you're doing this for a couple of weeks, I've now got five or six different ways to get to your back. Mm-hmm. that you can't stop but i've also noticed that i keep passing up arm bars i keep passing up guillotines and then here comes monday my two weeks is up i can do anything i want well i'm going to start to go to the back but all of a sudden there's all these other things that i remember passing yeah and it just opened up 20 more things in my game now i can start the same entry to try to get to your back but i'm going to catch that camera mm-hmm. i'm going to catch your neck i'm going to catch an arm bar you know all those things and, and by just picking to try to do one thing, you have to get through all these positions to get there, and your mind's gonna remember all the things that you didn't pa- that you didn't catch because you're like, mm, I wish yeah. I could have got that arm bar, yeah. you know, but I, I'm not allowed, yeah. you know? And then when, once I started rolling with, with everything available, everything yeah. is available. And I've had a few people do that and, and that have asked me like, what can I work on? Yeah. Change their game. I call that, uh, so I have, a, I have, there's a concept that I teach. I call it one plus one is three. Okay. You like that? <laughs> yeah. You like that? Cause it's like, you, that's it, how that, politics work these days too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Common core. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, basically what you're doing is you're, 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 you know, you're pay, taking a weak point, which is f- rear naked choke. Right. Right. And through the rear naked choke, you're getting, you're like, you have to go through a positional exchange and you're, um, like for example, my best submission used to be off of the back was I would let them escape and I would go to the head and arm. Oh, nice. Okay. That so that was, that was like, yeah, 
Yeah, that was. Uh, oh, uh, the, oh, no, no, oh, no, the, yes. The head and arm. Right off to the that head. side. Yeah, sure, yeah. yes. Okay, so that was that was like what I like. I love the head and arm, right? But because I did that for so long, it made me deficient in my rear choke, right? So think about it like it's the same thing it's just we just do different attacks right, right? it's like the rear naked choke will set up the head and arm and the head and arm will set up the rear naked choke right so it's like after the end you have like a like an added benefit where, where it's like it's not like one plus one is two it's like right. one plus one is three, three. right yeah. Not to yeah. give you any ammo for next time, but <laughs> I actually escape off to the side that gives you the head and arm uh -huh. because I set up a guillotine off of that. Nice. <laughs> I, as I'm coming off and they're starting to get this, I'll yeah. pressure down on their head mm. so they lift it, which allows me to elevate and snag yeah. their neck and then turn into them to catch a guillotine nice. off of that. But yeah, it's uh, the the head and arm's always there. Yeah, you know, if you if you direct them to that side, yeah. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so. Uh, you you end up with 10 11 fights 11 fights i had a 13 total two or two or no contest you know i um i lost my last fight so it'd be like 10 and 10 and 2 um but he uh f failed a drug test and missed weight and did a bunch of stuff but uh um that was that was also a big uh learning experience mostly because you know like part of like one of the core things that i teach even with like striking is that you know like you shouldn't you shouldn't teach yourself to attack from out of position right and in that fight i did attack once from out of position and i paid for it so he was another southpaw and as i threw my hook i didn't see his hook and boom went right on my chin and it was like i wasn't out but i, I couldn't recover you know what i'm saying like right. i you know like i'm my eyes are open and all that stuff but it was like it was a good stoppage but um, I learned a lot from that. And everything else before that was going fine. You know, um, uh, I adapted well to, uh, so I, I came out and I pump faked. And when I pump faked, he dropped the hand, but not to, not to like down block he, for like a punch. So I, instead of like shooting towards the hip level where that's where my head position would be, I just decided to double jab and then go to the over under. And then from over under, I hit a big throw uh, passed and then I think I went for yeah, I, I had a Kimura, but I kind of got bridge out of position and I wound up in an arm bar and it's <laughs> it's still uh, it still popped his arm so because I, I, I popped his arm with my cup like how uh, oh. uh, Sylvia and Mir remember yeah. remember that one where it was like down here it snapped right mm -hmm. you see it turn white all of a sudden yeah, it? yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah I had a um, that was your in your last fight that, that was my last fight yeah that was to get into the that was to get into the UFC, and um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I blew it, but um, like I said, I think I probably got. I felt like whatever happened just happened on the ground. When it started back on the feet, I was like, "Oh, it's gonna be easy," and that that is a mistake in mind. Right. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that was kind of like a bigger mistake that I made in that fight, and in that fight, it I. I paid. <laughs> Ended up being a no contest. Ended up being a no contest, but yeah, it's a it was a loss for sure. Um, so ten and two, okay. ten and two. Uh, I would say unofficially. Who, who was the other one? My Japan fight, and then uh, I thought I. I mean, I still think I won that fight. Like I, I, mean, I thought I won the Gomi fight too, but it is what so it is. <laughs> so the only thing so so I got five takedowns in the fight. I controlled, and uh, I was with Jeremy for that fight. And there's a there's a funny story. So. We're at the rules meeting, and this was 2006. It might have been the January of 2006. Yeah, it was six. That year, they changed the pancreas rules, okay? So we're at the rules meeting, and they go, elbow, yes, elbow, yes, whoops, elbow, like, like uh, 12 to 6, no. I raise my hand. I go, so if you're on top, you can elbow like this. They go, yes. Okay. So guess what? Second round, I am in close guard. And I have him in a, uh, I call it Tito control. Because it's, it's one of the, it's like a gooseneck grip from close guard where you suck it up. And then you got to hand fight this one. And you got clear shots at his head. Like he did to Ken Shamrock? Tito? <laughs> um, no. No. Uh, it could have been. I can't. I can't think of the fight off the top of my head. But um, he used it against Elvis Sinisic, where okay. he he uh, he really compresses the guard, 
And for someone that's like tall and skinny, if you keep the leg up, it keeps them in a stack position. Okay. So I land like five right on this dude's dome. And after the fifth one, they go, no elbow. And I go, <laughs> dude, I look at Jeremy and Jeremy goes, I'm like, dude, Japan. yeah, Japan. Yeah, exactly. So the only thing he did, so with a minute left, he actually dropped me. And this is the only shot he landed. He drops me with a body shot and he tries to, so you could soccer kick to the head on the ground. So he tries a flying foot stomp and my foot catches his, the bend of his knee and he almost flies out of the ring. He comes back to try to like get me, I immediately get him in an arm bar. So the fight ends with me having him in an arm bar and he got my foot and he put it underneath the rope. So I couldn't like finish him and that's how the fight ended. And I'm like, dude, there's no way I lost a fight. Right. Cause it's like, I dominate, dude, I, I won the fight for 14 and a half minutes and it's like you could make an argument. Oh, he almost knocked you out. Yeah, well, I almost arm, I almost broke his arm. Right. You know. So anyway, I lost that one. But yeah, it was a. Uh, I didn't. I still. I still don't think I lost that. Yeah. I, it didn't feel like I lost it when I walked out of the ring, but it's okay. Yeah, my that, that experience was really good. You know, um, they treated me really well. You know, they took me like sightseeing and all this stuff. Oh, nice. And uh, just the, they took me out to dinner. The dinner was like six hundred bucks. It was oh, wow. like crazy. So that the experience was good. It was the first three, five minute fight that I had fought. It was the first time I'd ever fought in a ring. You know, like I didn't know how to cut off the corner. I didn't know. How, there was lots of like things that like I learned later after that. I liked the ring. Uh, people mm -hmm. ask me all the time and, and I liked the ring because I thought, number one, your wrestling had to be better. Mm hmm. You didn't have the fence. Yeah. You know, it wasn't as easy to take someone down on the ropes. Yeah. So it, it took a different skill. You know, your your actual wrestling, you couldn't stuff them into the fence to beat them up. Yeah. You know, you had to do it in the open. Um, so it just, I think it took a little bit more, uh, a little more skill, you yeah. know, fight, fight IQ to, to win a fight on the ground, especially, you know, in, in a ring as opposed to in the strike. And you can get cut off real easy. You know, as opposed to in a, in a circle or an octagon, you know, there's the corners are, are very shallow or yeah. not at all. Yeah. And so cutting them off, you really have to cut off. But in a, in a, in a square, it's easy to get cut off. Um, but but yeah, fighting in a ring was was uh, I, I enjoyed it. I never got to fight for Pancrase. So I fought for Shudo over there and I fought mm -hmm. for Pride, but I never got to fight for Pancrase. And, and that's cool that, that that was your first fight over there. huh? Uh, yeah and got to fight him my first experience over there was shudo it was was gomi yeah and uh close fight you know i i thought i won one and three um but i knew i knew he was number one in the world at the time there was no way if yeah. it went the distance that i was winning and and that was a close one yours you know sounds like it was not yeah. that close the guy still. the guy won uh so so that fight was to get us into like a four-man tournament and that that guy won the pancreas belt oh he did mm -hmm. yeah wow awesome um, but yeah like when you so when you fought gomi that was right when I joined you guys. And I remember like, I had even uh, before I met you, I followed like all the Shudo guys. Like I love like Ruman Asato and Sakurai and all those guys. So I knew exactly who Gomi was. And like, I remember you had the, you had the tape and I'm like watching it and I'm like, dude, you're like beating his ass, dude. <laughs> Holy crap, dude. And he was the number one guy yeah. back then, you know, and, and he was a takedown guy. You got all the takedowns. Yeah, I got four takedowns. He hadn't been taken down yet yeah. in his career. I think he was 10 and 0 at the time, and I had taken him down four times. But that fight I took on eight weeks' notice, and I was supposed to fight Sakurai. Mm -hmm. And um, I, was ma I made a huge cut because I forget who I fought before Gomi, whoever my fight was before Gomi. The, 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 um, but I had rebounded and been real heavy. I flew to Japan the next day after my fight to, to corner. And by the time I got home, I was 206. And I just like, I was bloated. Damn. And I back then I was walking at like 90, 95. Mm -hmm. um, and I was 206 when they called. And I had eight weeks to make one, at the time, 170. One. 167 was Shudo's weight. Oh, yeah. So I said yes. So I start cutting and start training. Four weeks into my camp, they call and say, hey, soccer, I got hurt. Will you fight Gomi? And I was like, yeah, I'll fight whoever, you know, I don't, you know, me yeah. back then I was like, I'll fight whoever. So, uh, when, when that, I hung up and then I was like looking up, I was like, oh, he fights at 155. 
I told Zach, I was like, hey, call him back and tell him I, it's got to be somebody else. I can't make mm -hmm. 155. And then he's like, okay. And he's like, are you sure? And I was like, what do you mean? Like, I cut like 15 pounds to, to make 70. Yeah. You know, and uh, that's a that's a, another 15 pound cut. Yeah. You so. know, and uh, and he's like, yeah, I don't know. You know, it's for the shooto belt. He's the champ. And I was like, all right, let's go. So Dang. I spent the next four weeks cutting all the way to 55, 54.3 or four, whatever their weight class is. Did you see who I fought? Shannon Rich. Oh yeah, okay, so I fought Shannon, and uh, uh, 10 days, I think, before, nine or 10 days before I fought uh, Gomi, right? 10 days. Yeah. So I had blown up and then had to come back, and, and uh, so when, when, when I, I got there, mm -hmm. my cut was, you know, it was brutal. I did, there was no sauna. And yeah. we had to make the bathroom into a sauna. And I did 25 five-minute rounds in plastics in the bathroom with the, with the shower running. And uh, basically throughout the night and, and made the weight. First round, I was solid. You know, yeah. I felt like I, I won. And in the second round, I had a light, a little lull where I started to feel tired. And, and he was hitting me a little bit, but I was fine. And then got a second win for the third round. And I felt like I had done enough in that round as well. But at the same time, I did not stand up. Even though in my head I won the fight, I didn't stand up thinking or any any sort of you know false whatever that I was going to get my hand raised. I knew I wasn't, but I, I was just I was actually just pumped on the performance. That's my favorite fight still to this day, yeah. just because a lot of action. It was against you know uh, the best guy at the time, and and I was fortunate enough to get guys like him and Militech and you know guys that, that were the best at that time. Mm -hmm. And whether whether it went my way or not, I got a hell of a lot of experience yeah. out of it. Yeah. And there's no substitute for experience. There's definitely yeah, not. Definitely I get to come not. home and teach, you yeah. know, teach people what what yeah. I learned and and uh, not teach the the things that didn't. So I distinctly remember uh, one part of that fight. I remember it, and uh, Jeremy was cornering you, correct? Yeah. And so you had a you basically had your Kimura, and remember you switched to like a leg scissor choke. It but was actually tight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I switched at three things. And he said, stop moving, stop moving. Cause I had like three things that were probably could have finished. Yeah. And I, I, I went from, I, I, he, he had a single leg on me and I swept him with it and landed right in home base. Mm -hmm. Started, started pulling on the arm, but I had like jujitsu ADD. I went like arm bar, it's not working. Scissor choke, it's not working. Then came up to try to do a side control Kimura mm -hmm. and I tried to roll through, but I did it without my knee on the belly. So when I rolled through, he ended up in side control on me. Mm. And that was another thing when I show that technique, I even mentioned, I was like, so I screwed this up in a fight, but your knee has to be here in order for this to work. If it's not here, they end up in side control on you. And, and so I like to be able to teach and, and not be afraid, you know, to, this is where I failed at this. Oh, and yeah. This is where it works, yeah. you know, and I'll, I'll even teach if I teach something and pair everyone up and go around and I remember, I'll be hold on time out. I forgot, you know, don't forget to do this, you know, or, or, or I was wrong. Let you, you're supposed to do it this way. Um, just because I came up at the very beginning at the Gracie Academy mm -hmm. where it was, they're going to teach you how to do something for six months. And then they're going to tell you, no, don't do it that way anymore. Now you'll get triangle. If you pass with your hand yeah. on the bicep, do it this way. Yeah. And so I just learned something for six months and created a, a solid habit for six months that I now have to break and, and do it a different way, mm -hmm. you know, and that's just, you know, terrible teaching, mm -hmm. terrible teaching. Yeah. You break the guard by sticking yourself in a triangle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, in, in the first time it happened to me, I, I was getting triangled and as I got into the intermediate class and, and I'm like, Horian, I'm getting triangled when I pass like this, triangle me. And he posture real strong and hand on the bicep and, and end up passing my guard. You know, I was freaking white belt, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe got my blue belt. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, okay. You know, but then I would try it and I would get triangled. Yeah. And it was like, <laughs> and, and then later on in that class, you know, they'll teach you this comes back here, mm -hmm. then this here to pass. And you know, your elbow's got to stay here. You don't want to be able one arm inside, you'll get triangled. I'm yeah. like, who the fuck were you six <laughs> months ago? You know, it's like so frustrating because they're just taking your cash over yeah. and over again. And that's why, and you're the same way, whether I teach a brand new guy or a fifth degree black belt, I'm teaching the black belt way. I'm teaching you the best way to yeah. do it 
right now, yeah. you know, that I'm teaching you how I do it. Mm -hmm. Even if it's your day one, this is, this is the way to do it. You don't drag it on, you know, to, for longevity of your student, you know, yeah. you want to, you want to get them. And, and you were saying like, I did it with you guys. I wanted to create the best training partners I could as quick as I could. Yeah. So it's like, here's a, I'm going to feed you with the friggin' fire hose, but mm -hmm. this is the technique and let's drill the crap out of it yeah. and, and make you as good as possible, as quick as possible. That's one of the things that I definitely had like a real high amount of respect for, for you is because you're almost like, you're almost like betting on yourself. Yeah. Does that make sense? So what, what I mean by that is that, you know, you actually are putting work into your own, you know, you're not milking us for money or anything like that. You're actually trying to get us as good as possible. And in turn, that's making you better. So it's like, we're going, we're doing this. You know what I'm saying? And I was and running the whole time trying the, to stay. That's the real, yeah. How do I stay the, better than them? <laughs> yeah. That's the real, um, that's how something should work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you know, I remember, um, coming in and you just having, dude, every guy in Orange County that was there was like the man, you know, all the guys were fighting. I remember distinctly, everyone had good triangle and armbar sequences from, from guard, like everybody, even like the white belts, they know how to turn their hips. They know how to pull the, they, they know how to keep the, go to the shin and control the head on the triangle. It was, everything was very, uh, uh, uniform. But the, the main thing was just, the fact that like, you know, you'd come back from like the fight with Gomi and then you would break it down. We'd be on the mat and you'd be showing us like, Hey, this is where I messed up. And it was pretty awesome. Yeah. I was, I was just telling Luke the other day it would, we were, I was, uh, I never played the, the coach, you know, I'm better than you role. Yeah. We would be pulling out of Saboba if I lost and the jokes would start before we hit the street. Like <laughs> people would be like, you know, there'd be someone making a sarcastic remark about it. And I was like, okay, you yeah. know, and, and it was just, everyone was always so cool. And there was yeah. at one time there was 20 of us, 20 pros training together, sparring together all the time from, from Ian's size to Kawhi's size, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? And, and, um, it was, yeah, it was what a room. What a room. We we would have. It didn't matter if we were going to a fight or going to Vegas for Grappler's Quest or where yeah. we're going. Very very few losses, you mm -hmm. know, took place. It was it was awesome back then. Pretty crazy. Yeah. So, you got your own gym now. Mm -hmm. What what made you stop fighting? So, <clears throat> after it was uh, so after my loss, I was still actively f um, training and. Uh, so funny story that's actually when my boxing started to get good <laughs> After. um so i had a sustained a knee injury and with my knee injury i couldn't do a level change to shoot like a double but i can be in like a boxing stance and like i can move around so basically on accident you know it forced me to box and instead of boxing mma fighters you know my boxing coach had gotten me to a level very quickly um to where i'm sparring um one of the amateurs had like 80 fights uh, another pro that was like you know like he was like maybe like six and six but he was like a 54 pounder um i had uh met many different types of boxers and we got like good rounds in and i felt like that really sped up how fast my boxing got right. good who are you boxing with uh jimmy jackson okay jimmy jackson yeah he was um what I, I, li I liked him for many reasons, but one of the things I liked about him was he, you know, he didn't know much about jujitsu or grappling, but he would sit and watch my class and watch how I teach. And I remember the first, um, the, I think it was like the first knockout I got in sparring. It's, uh, I basically, as a southpaw against orthodox, I'm leaning in this way. And what it does, it gets the guy to throw his right hand. And as the guy throws his right hand, I drag out and I, it's kind of like a, a hand, my hand goes down first and it, it, it hits the head where, so the he direction of the head's going this way, my hook's going this way. So you don't throw it hard. You just kind of drag it, it and on. it starches them on the side of their head and they're down, dude. And it's like, I don't even hit them that hard. And that was from, he, he goes, so I was teaching one day and I'm explaining what a bait setup is. He goes, so you like bait setups. <laughs> and so he's showing me, I'm like, oh, okay. Like, he's understanding concepts. He's dragging concepts that I already know and dragging them across. And I'm like learning quickly. And you know, when you're, you have an injury and you can only do one thing, you're going to put all your time into that one thing. Right? right. So I, yeah, I got to a level physically 
where I was essentially doing close to um, 18 rounds of boxing every day. Uh, some of the days I would do 12 only, like if I was sparring, but almost 18 rounds every day. Then I would do uh, fight class or jujitsu, and then I would lift after. So it'd be close to three and a half or four hours a day. I would do that Monday through Friday. I'd take Saturday and Sunday off. But uh, 2012, I got a skin infection. Okay, and at the beginning, it didn't start out as it wasn't too bad. But um, so I go to the doctor and they're like, hey, it's a staph infection. And I'm like, D I've had staph before. It doesn't feel like a staph infection because this is like, it's like itchy. It's super, super itchy. They're like, who's the doctor type thing? And I'm like, well, dude, like I I've lived it. Right. You know what I'm saying? I've grappled for many years and I've seen like many, whatever, dude. So start taking the antibiotics, feel horrible, like immediately. Um, I was in Canada cornering Adam and I had to go to the emergency room. Dude, it's literally like, um, it started out on my arm, probably like the size of a, I'd say a dime. Okay. And it wasn't like super bad. It was just felt like uncomfortable and it was like constantly itching it. And I, well, trying not to itch it. It was itchy. Right. Okay. Dude, I, it was like one day in Canada. I was like, it was like here on my, it was all over. It was like a systemic type thing. One of the guys was like, dude, you pro should probably either go to the doctor or go to the hospital. So I went to the clinic first. The clinic was like, listen, we're not going to charge you. Just go to the hospital. This nice lady at the clinic drove me 45 minutes. In Canada? In Canada. She didn't even know me. She, she drove me all the way to the hospital. And they're basically... Uh, in like uh, they, they put me in like a little quarantine thing with the zip up tent they're freaking in hazmat <laughs> suits and i'm like trying to crack jokes with them like hey guys is this really like necessary and they're like listen dude you could die before you get on the plane i'm like dude what <laughs> and so so no joke um they're basically putting like um they had me on another oral antibiotic and they basically the next step is to IV me with antibiotics and so I'm kind of tired, you know, like my body's just been through a lot and like the antibiotics are just freaking wrecking me, dude. It's, uh, I ended up losing, uh, 27 pounds in four days from the Whoa. antibiotics. So like I pass out, okay. They're like, you know, they're in the process of IV me and like literally and I have a dream where the dream is like, yo dude, you need to check yourself out of the hospital right now. Like in, in the dream, it's like, it's, in, it's kind of like in symbols, but it's kind of like, listen, like you need to go home and clean your body out and that will take care of the infection. So it's like, it's like in my dream. So I wake up, I'm like, uh, Hey, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go. They're like, no, you can't, you can't go. I'm like, there is a way I can go. I have to sign these medical release forms and then I can go. They, and, and I feel like in the United States, like the doctors would just be like, F you, you Bye. know what I'm saying? <laughs> the doctors in Canada, they actually gave a F, you know what I'm saying? They were like, listen, kid, okay, I've seen this, not a lot, but it can ha can happen. Like, you know, sometimes if you have a systemic infection, you know, it can get to your heart, you can have a heart attack. Like, there's many things that can go wrong. He goes, when are you going home? And I'm like, well, I'm going home on, a, the fight was on a Saturday and was uh, we go home on a Sunday. He goes, I'm not, I'm not saying for sure, but like, Dude, you might, not, you might not make it home. And I'm like, I'm okay. You know, just, I'm going to go home. Go home. Rhiannon picks me up from the airport. Dude, I'm, I am, remember, I'm 27 pounds smaller than when she dropped me off. And I am like, in her words, she goes, you were like pale white. Dude, I'm like so freaking weak. And I'm, I don't even want to show her. Like, I know she's going to be worried and all this stuff. And. I remember taking it off, dude, and it was all, dude, it was crazy. It was literally like crazy. Like I couldn't believe how much worse it got from the time I freaking went to the hospital to the time I got home. I'm like, oh, but I went to the health food store. I bought pretty much all these green supplements, looked up online, like aloe vera, like I was taking baths and like things that like, uh, um, like neem, neem leaves. So neem leaves, uh, oatmeal, um, apple cider vinegar all I had the like it took two or three baths a day it was like in all this stuff um, I had uh, low protein um, no 
dairy, no like heavy fats and mostly like greens and green juices. And in the first uh, time I slept, I slept for 18 hours. And when I woke up, I was freaking exhausted. Dude, it was so hard for me to just to walk to the bathroom. And uh, so, you know, I recovered in the sense that like in a few days it actually started to go away and then I was feeling strong enough to get back to the gym. And I, re I remember, <laughs> so the, when I left off, I, tr I was trap bar deadlifting 355 pounds for sets of five. And then I remember when I came back to try to lift, I did um, seven reps with 135 and I was, <laughs> I was sore for 11 days. I got a black eye in sparring and it didn't heal for six weeks. And so I started to realize like whatever happened to my body, like seriously jacked up my body. And so I had to research more online and I'm like, I had a bad microbial imbalance in my stomach and my body can't digest proteins like it did. Like I was telling you earlier, right. like I was like the guy I'd touch a weight and have a whey protein. And I'm like, boom, like, right. you know what I'm saying? Like in one day I would have, you'd be like, you'd be, Oh, Russ, you lifting again. I'm like, yeah, one day, you know what I'm saying? Like I was that guy, you know, and I was definitely not that guy after that. And it, and even it's been 10 years and even still to this day, you know, I've got to take digestive enzymes with a lot of my food. Uh, but it was something that really, really, uh, affected my health, um, ended up being permanently, but you know, I learned how to eat properly. Um, most of my diet, is a uh, higher fat higher fat gives me a lot of energy and um moderate protein and then low carbohydrates most of my carbohydrate sources are uh berries um occasionally i'll have like brown rice um and that's uh and then coconut water and then that's it that's like my only carb source in it i've been on a diet like that for close to about 10 years now and that seems to be what works um the best but yeah, I, after that moment, I became very uh, active. I started to research more and more about health and um, recovering the body and resting the body. And like, you know, I'm, not, you know, I'm 41 now. So I, I still try to get my lifts in, but it's only twice a week. And it's not like, it's not like it was, you know, like, <laughs> I, you know, for me, I need to keep my knees strong, my back strong, my neck strong, all of that stuff. Right. And if I could do that and, you know, I've, I've got my body weight up to 160, which is great. But then the other bad side of it is I can I have the ability to lose that muscle quickly. So um, if my diet's good though, I can maintain that muscle. So what are you at right now? I'm about between, I'm probably about 152. Okay. And and like I said, I was I was good. Uh, bef around Christmas time, I was lifting. I was almost up to 160, and I felt great. My body, my rolls, everything felt great. And then I got sick, um, not with COVID. This was like a flu, like after I had COVID and then same thing. I lost 10 pounds like that. And it's like, Oh man, all those gains, <laughs> all, that work. all that work, man. And it's so hard to get back, but you know, I'm willing to put in the work. I'm definitely willing to put in the work. And, um, occasionally like I'll, I'll try to nap when I get home sometimes in between my morning class and my kids class that definitely helps. Um, and like I said, my diet, my diet's, uh, as clean as it can be. Um, what do you eat for fats? So my fat sources are typically um, uh, coconut oil or MCT oil. Um, olive oil is like really good for me. The fat that's in uh, the egg yolk is really good for me. Um, the grass fed butter or uh, sometimes butter can be irritating to me, but like ghee, it's like clarified butter, um, avocados, um, I, uh, nuts like um, macadamia, um, Brazil nuts. Um, sometimes I'll have pistachio nuts. Uh, and then that's, that's pretty much it uh, as far as, uh, uh, like fat sources go. And I feel like, um, and then just as long as I'm not having like a ton of fat at one time, uh, it gives me a good amount of energy. And so the keto diet has worked better for me than any other type of diet. Um, the problem with consuming carbohydrates for myself in a higher amount is it's basically feeding like the bad bacteria in my gut. Right. And like I said, like I use the example this morning, like that big cinnamon roll. Right. If I probably, even if I ate a quarter of that cinnamon roll, I'll probably feel sick for about three days. Wow. And it, it's, it's miserable. It's the, like extreme fatigue, uh, brain fog, hard to sleep. You know, my digestion is 
like it'll wreck my digestion just with one high carb thing. It so looked I, really good though. It was it looked delicious, man. <laughs> it was definitely huge. It, was, it was probably <laughs> like it was probably like this big. <laughs> yeah. And, and thick uh, yeah super thick and uh i'm yeah i, I miss it i yeah. definitely miss it but i probably haven't had uh me and rhiannon went to cabo about six months ago and i had i had one ice cream and that didn't bother me too bad uh but i haven't had ice cream for like close i thought to, you were gonna close, say you had more because it didn't bother you no you I, I know better it. i know good, better good. through through trial and error good yeah awesome but but, but yeah after that um so I got a call for another fight and so the last time I fought I weighed in at 144 and a half stepped in the cage at 165 just like power clean 250 snatched 190 squat ass to ground 330 for three like I was really really strong right? right so they call me for a fight step on the scale 138 pounds for 145 and my boxing coach is like i don't think it's smart for you to step in the cage like that i'm like dude i don't think so either dude yeah. i have like i have no i can't even run a mile dude my my workout routine before this was i'd run four miles um f five days in a row on sand then i come in box 18 rounds then i do practice and then on certain days i would lift after that so sometimes it'd be about three three and a half hours sometimes as much as like four hours and 15 minutes and one that's one workout i didn't do the two a days because i learned with my body because i was more fast twitch if i did two a days it burned me out because you're getting like 12 hours recovery time versus when you're doing one workout a day like what manny pacquiao was doing right you're getting 20 hours of recovery and that worked really well for me i learned that like later in my career and i loved it i love <clears throat> training like that and I felt like the quality of work that I was getting in was so good. You know, you're finding out, you know, everybody's different. But I felt like as a fighter, that was something that I had tapped into just from like knowing how my body is. And, and uh, with the recovery, if you get 20 hours of recovery versus 12 hours, it's such a big difference for myself. What do you, so what do you consider a workout? Like, are you, are you including you rolling in jujitsu or is that separate? Or are you not rolling in jujitsu at that now? time? No, oh, no, oh, oh, during, oh. during. When I was messed up or when I was training? Like training for a, a fight. You said you were getting one workout a day. Yeah, so, so, so the workout was basically a four mile run on the beach. Then I would um, get in my car, I'd drive straight to, straight to the gym. I would do anywhere from like 12 to 18 rounds of boxing. Then I would either do fight class or jujitsu. And you know, when I was doing jujitsu, I was probably doing probably like, I would say like four tens, something like that, like four tens. And sometimes I'd have new guys come in halfway through the round, but um, yeah, from the- So when you say four or one workout, but it's for like for hours. Yeah, okay. yeah. And yes, even though there's a break between the morning run and by the time I get to the gym, I would still consider them connected, right. you know, because they're still um, all together. And then I would stretch after, and then that was pretty much it. And sometimes I would lift after I would do fight class or jujitsu okay so it was it was a it was a lot of work but also like i was like done yeah i was like that was probably the best shape i've ever been in and it was i was just so used to just doing work and work and work and it was like you know at that time i could recover and everything was and my diet my diet was also back then it was pretty good i was eating like my last fight i was eating like 3500 calories a day even like all the way up to one day before the weigh-in. Nice. Yeah. So I was like pretty happy, you know. So how? Why did you end up at 138? That was from the antibiotics and from when I had gotten okay. sick. And I remember when I tried to come back to the gym, I'm like trying to lift, can't lift. Try to run, can't run. Um, like did one sparring session with uh, one of my guys. It was a little bigger, but um, he gave me a black eye. But I, the black eye didn't go away for six weeks. Yeah, that's crazy. So there was there was definitely something going on with like uh, recovery and um, I, ultimately it was just my ability to break down proteins. And I, you know, I'm I'm learning about it. I'm like, dude, what's going on with my body? And essentially, there's like, you know, there, there's a microbe that 
that um, when it grows out of control, it can kind of neutralize your stomach acid. Your stomach acid is needed to break down like um, proteins right. into amino acids, but also things like B12, uh, iron, uh, zinc, magnesium. That was another thing. I cramped all the time, all the time, no matter how much fluid I had, electrolytes, I would cramp all the time. It was like, it was like I was two different people. Wow. That's yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty brutal. So, so stop fighting. Mm -hmm. You competed still. You did more jujitsu tournaments after that. Yeah. After, after I kind of got my body under control and I understood what I could eat, couldn't eat, how I needed to recover, you know, like just coming to the understanding, like, Hey, no more du jour. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I used, I used to eat, before fight class, I used to eat a whole DiGiorno pizza and a whole pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream before and then train. class and then train super hard for like four hours straight. Yeah. I was probably like, you know, 24, 25 years old. Um, yeah, those days, there's no more days like that, <laughs> you know. But it's like, you know, you need to do that, you know. Like, it's, it's probably better that I did that earlier in life, like when I was just turned 30. Right. I'm like, all right, listen, I got to educate myself and put the right foods in my body, take my health serious starting now, right. not like when I have some health problem when I'm older, you know, and maybe in the long run, it might have been better for my overall health. You know, I've helped many students um, either overcome similar things, but I've helped them with nutrition. I've helped them with um, uh, some of them. I've helped kids. I've helped with weight loss, you know, like apple cider vinegar and coconut oil before a meal. Dude, they, one of my kids lost like 40 pounds. Wow but he still eats like fast food you know <laughs> it's not, you don't take away you just add and it's like it, it'll start to burn the fat as fuel you know but um yeah I, I enjoy doing that too i enjoy helping people on a level that even is outside of jujitsu but it's something that i've gone through in my life that i want to help people avoid if at all possible oh and then the the ending of the story is i didn't even have a bacterial infection it was a fungal infection, just like I fucking said. <laughs> Doctor's like, sorry. I'm like, didn't you call me Dr. Google, bro? Like, yeah, so it was a fungal infection. So They definitely don't want to be wrong. Yeah, they definitely don't want to be wrong. All right, so competition-wise, yeah. you're, you're basically, uh, your last competition was EBI? Yeah. Yeah, and that was how long ago? 2015, so I did EBI 2 and EBI 4. EBI 2 was at 155, and uh, so when I, I think I only had like five weeks to train for that, and I remember like I started to lift, and I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna lift for this one. Like it was, I was just way too sore. Like I probably should have started lifting before that, but I had made the decision only like five weeks out. Right. And like I said, a lot of my training was geared towards, you know, get, get your game good, you know, sh tighten up your game, um, you know, work hard passing, hard on the feet. Um, but I didn't do any of the overtime practices at all. I was just going to go in there, um, you know, see how I did. Um, first match was like a kid from uh, Canada that did pretty well at the previous um, EBI. And uh, go out, <clears throat> he, uh, he sits, and uh, he actually gets to a leg position. And I defend by going to my guard and egg beating my leg inside. So I kind of have like... Uh, butterfly guard and immediately I shoot my leg into my own leg lock and finish him uh, my second match was um, like a slick uh, half guard kid that won his first match with like a half guard back take uh, to like a Renega choke and I um, decimated this kid's guard with guard passing I, I think it was about four guard passes um, and then uh, I ended up finishing him also with a heel hook uh, then the match with Denny was also a good match. Um, I got a takedown, a guard pass, a mount, and that was what happened in the regulation time. And oh. then in the in the overtime, uh, I got uh, he escaped my armbar position, and then he finished me with the uh, rear naked choke. And uh, it was a good. Uh, he had a good figure four control, and like I said, I didn't. I'm not making excuses at all. He he deserved to win, but um, I I didn't work any of the overtimes. Right. The second one that I did, um, I went against a kid that had just won the Brown Belt Worlds in the first round. And uh, this was when I was kind of working a lot of like um, like modes. So like one mode is like, all right, put passing on him, put passing on him, passing on him. And I remember 
it was probably after like three minutes i remember like he's like breathing hard and i i passed already once and he he replaced but i remember like i was like hadn't really put it on him yet right and I remember I got into one sequence that was three entry and his leg went right here at the minute one and I didn't touch it. And I remember I did the same sequence, boom, 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 but now he's tired. And I went boom, straight ankle lock and just got a basic finish. So uh, it was cool because my students that were watching, it, they, they knew exactly what I did because I was just teaching that. Yeah. You know, they we were, talked about this, yeah, yeah. breaking them down, wearing them out, wearing them yeah, out, so, seeing so, what's going on and then bang, take yeah, it. The pattern, the pattern becomes the setup, even though the pattern might be defending all of your moves. Right. You know what I'm saying? So the, I redid the pattern. The pattern, his leg is going to be right here. And this time I use the hand to feed and I collect and then I finish. <clears throat> my uh, second match, and even though my second match was against Eddie Cummings and this was the first one that Eddie Cummings won, okay? And I learned a lot in this loss and I like my true students knew once I came back to the gym, I had corrected a lot of uh, things. So one of the things I worked for that EBI was like hand fighting and grip fighting and making sure you have the correct grip in order to start your attack sequence. And he out grip fought me like, like I was like he out his grip fighting level was several levels above mine. Okay. And so, um, however, I'm defending every type of like leg entry that he's in. So he's getting his two on one grip, but I'm leg weaving my leg. So I'm in good position. Um, it was probably about two and a half minutes in. He, he gets in on one of my legs. And when I go to defend, he switches to the other leg and he got the, I think they call it outside Ashi where it's like the, the leg, the inside leg crosses over with the figure four. Right. And uh, he, um, he sweeps and when he sweeps, I went to turn and it was, I was going like nowhere. And I, I felt it in my knee, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, yeah. I got a gym, you know, I got all this stuff going on and it's like, I, I got to tap. And that was another thing that my students said, they were like, you know, I guess they, did, they, they were, they weren't happy that I lost, but they were like, oh, like coach tapped. It's like, okay, you right. know what I'm saying? Like this guy destroys people's legs and knees. Right. And uh, if you look at all four of the matches in that EBI, I was the one that had like the right idea as far as like going against someone like Eddie Cummings. So last thing, yeah. um, your, your tournaments. Talk mm -hmm. about your tournaments real quick. Yeah, so they're uh, essentially, um, you know, your tournaments just, uh, you know. Modernized? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> modernized. Um, I started them in 2010 and you know back then there was only one uh one tournament that wasn't single elimination okay and like coming from a wrestling background you, you want like if you really care you want the guys and the kids to get mat time and experience and that's the whole concept of my tournament right right so uh, some of them are um round robin format and some of them are double elimination it depends on how many people are in the bracket but i've always stayed true to that i've always um like i said i've always refunded i've i've refunded money to people that were just assholes yeah. but i'm like but don't come back <laughs> you know what i'm saying like, don't, don't, come back. don't come back yeah so uh um I think over the years it's really accrued like a decent following. I have my next tournament coming up on May 15th. It's the first big tournament that I've thrown since COVID. So everyone's like super out of high school, right? out of high school. So it's like a big one and I'm really excited. You know, my, I got probably 12 kids competing and like probably like uh, eight adults. Nice. So it's, it'll nice. be a good day. Yeah. Sweet. Mm -hmm. um, tell us where your gym's at. Tell us how you can find you. So I'm uh, located in Laguna Hills. My name, uh, my, Jim is called uh, Russ Muir Jiu Jitsu or Next Generation Orange County. Um, stop by for a free class anytime. Can you find you online anywhere, Instagram or Facebook or anything? Yeah, that? you can type in Russ Muir Jiu Jitsu or Russ Muir Subfighter.com and that's, that's the site to go to. Awesome. Thank you, dude. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. It is all over. Just like that.